We've been told that iOS 17 is going to be just a minor update, but these new leaks that come from very reliable sources are saying otherwise. So we're gonna talk about that and a lot more in this week's episode of iOS Weekly. So iOS 17 has been kept under wraps pretty well by Apple this year, and we really haven't seen too many specifics about what's coming in the software, but now we have a pretty big one, and this is a new default application that we're hearing is coming in iOS 17, and it's not exactly what I thought. According to the Wall Street Journal, Apple is planning to launch a new iPhone journaling app journal journaling uh, anyway this will allow us to jot down our daily activities just like you would in a physical journal the app which is codenamed jurassic is designed to help users keep track of their daily lives it's going to analyze the user's behavior to determine what a typical day would look like including how much time is spent at home compared with elsewhere and whether a certain day included something outside of the norm and this application since it will be a default application will have access to your text messages, your phone calls, probably your calendar, all of that. So it's going to be able to see, you know, more data points and have more of an advantage over third party journaling applications out there right now, which don't have access to that more specific information, the more private information, if you will, like your text messages and things like that. So that's pretty big. So this does raise an eyebrow though, you know, when thinking about privacy, I, I know the first thing I thought about was like, wow, now Apple's going to know everything about everything in my life. They already knew all my passwords, all that, but now they know everything in my life as well. But Wall Street Journal touches on this because they say that according to the documents, everything will remain on device. So no need to worry about Apple or anyone else seeing that data, you know, as it's going through the cloud or whatever. So that appears to be a safe space. Now, me personally, I use the notes application a lot for journaling. I, I did it in the past. I haven't really done it recently, but I used to use the notes application for journaling. So I am very excited to see that a standalone journal application could be coming in iOS 17. But that's not the only iOS 17 news we got this week because we also got more details from Bloomberg's Mark Gurman. So Mark Gurman said that Apple is working on an AI powered health coaching service for tracking emotions. So this sounds very similar to what we just said, but he says it is a separate service, a separate thing from this journaling application. So it seems like Apple is really starting to focus on like mental health. So they already had a lot of the health you know, things down with the health application, the Apple Watch and all that. But now it looks like Apple is starting to really focus on mental health, which I like. Anyways, he says this, the new coaching service codenamed Quartz is designed to keep users motivated to exercise, improve eating habits and help them sleep better. The idea is to use AI and data from an Apple Watch to make suggestions and create coaching programs tailored to specific users. The initial version of the emotion tracker will let users log their mood, answer questions about their day, and compare the results over time. Another feature that German says is coming with iPad OS 17 is the health app. So this has been an iPhone exclusive for a while now, but now it looks like the iPad is going to get the health application for the first time. He does also mention in a recent podcast episode with Mac Rumors that iOS 17, iOS 17 now, not iPad OS 17, is going to bring changes to the wallet application, the Find My application, and the fact that sideloading might just be an EU exclusive. So this might not actually be for everybody on iOS 17. Sideloading could be exclusive just for where that law is in effect, which of course is in the EU. Now, this is probably going to eventually come out to everybody in the coming years, but it looks like at least for the start in iOS 17, that's going to be EU only. So everything we talked about up until now is probably going to happen with iOS 17. The Wall Street Journal and Mark Gurman, two highly, highly, you know, accurate sources in the past. So pretty much everything they say ends up coming true, most of it at least. So I would expect all of those things to come true. However, we do have a lot more to talk about with iOS 17, but you should take these with a grain of salt because they do not come from as reliable of sources. So this one comes from a leaker who accurately predicted some hardware in the past. So he hasn't predicted software correct, but he's predicted hardware. So here's what he said. And this was all on Weibo in another language, by the way. So I had to translate this, but it looks like it says control center UI changes 
support for custom categories and other organization features for the app library, the ability to view Apple Music lyrics directly on the lock screen, updates to the Apple Music user interface that reduces the amount of text in favor of new images and graphics, support for sharing lock screen designs with other people, presumably similar to existing support for sharing Apple Watch faces, additional lock screen customization options for fonts, emoji wallpapers, and other functions, and also adjustments for the flashlight brightness giving more fine-grained control. So we've now heard multiple times that the control center is going to be the main UX or the user experience feature that's going to be changed like the most in iOS 17. But the tricky thing here is that Mark Gurman was asked about this specifically. He was asked about control center you know, changes and he says that he's not aware of any control center changes. So this could come true, this could not. There's multiple people, but German, who is more reliable, is saying that it's not happening, or at least that he doesn't know about it. So it'll be interesting to see if we do see those big changes to the control center, which I would be very happy if we do see those because we've needed a control center redesign for a while now. And then as far as device compatibility goes, like which devices can update to iOS 17, we've heard conflicting rumors, and the two devices that we keep hearing about are the iPhone 8 and 8 Plus and the iPhone 10. So those two kind of seem to be, you know, Know, together either they're both going to be in ios 17 able to be updated or they're both not going to be able to be updated and they're going to be stuck on ios 16. so we're not sure yet we haven't really had any good source come through and say one way or the other. And then as far as iPad OS 17, iPhone Soft just said that these are going to be the iPads that will be supported. iPad Pro 2017 and later, iPad Air 3rd Gen and later, iPad 6 and later, and iPad Mini 5 and later. Before we talk about that new App Store scam you need to know about, let's talk about CarPlay. So if you've used CarPlay before, you probably won't buy another car without it, right? Well, for some reason, and we can probably thank Tesla for this, a lot of automakers are now starting to create their own software and and in turn, they're ditching CarPlay support altogether. And the latest example of this is from GM, who joined Tesla and Rivian in this move to not support CarPlay. Now, this happened a few weeks ago, but now the GM CFO elaborated on this decision. And also, Apple has seemingly responded with an update to their own CarPlay page. So just this week, the CFO for GM said this, If we're going to take that feature out of our vehicles, we need to respond with a program and a customer package that is equally as compelling, if not more more compelling. We think that the partnership we have with Google and ultimately with the vehicle data we have, we can create an experience that customers are going to love. Now, in response to this, Apple updated their CarPlay page, and now it says more than 800 models to choose from. It's easier than ever to find a vehicle that works with CarPlay. Before this move by GM, I can go back on Wayback Machine here, and it says we have 600 models. They've now updated that and I don't think it's a coincidence that they changed this to even more models and a new tagline after this whole GM debacle. Now let's talk about that new App Store scam that's happening right now. And of course, it is targeting AI and chat GPT applications. Go figure. So if you go into the App Store, whether it's on the Mac App Store on Mac OS or on iOS in the App Store, you will notice that if you search for chat GPT or AI, you will get a ton of applications that look like they are pretty much clones of each other and they have thousands of ratings, but these are not legit. These are actually scams. And earlier this week, a security researcher published a piece called The Dark Side of the Mac App Store, How Scam Apps and Shady Developers Are Preying on Users. And in this report, he explains that dozens of copycat ChatGPT applications are flooding the App Store. And not only are they getting tons of fake reviews to kind of shut out other developers from ranking in search, but these scam apps also have paywalls that are not able to be closed out of, which is forcing users to pay for a free service, which ChatGPT is free unless you're using the API or ChatGPT Plus. But the regular, you know, ChatGPT is free, but these applications are charging for it. And not just charging, they're charging by the week for it with a subscription. So just be aware of this. I know that ChatGPT and AI is still relatively new. So some users are still not aware that ChatGPT is a free service. You should not be paying for this on a weekly basis. And you can just see that these applications are all very, very similar to each other. They're pretty much all just clones of one another. And then speaking of AI, we need to talk about Snapchat's new update, which introduced this lady up here, my AI. 
AI. So this is a new, basically, ChatGPT integration in Snapchat, and it has caused quite the controversy over the internet. Now, of course, this is mainly from parents who have, you know, their 13-year-old daughter messaging my, my AI and, you know, telling it things, and this chatbot is responding, and parents are thinking that this is like a real person and that their child is in danger because of talking to a stranger, even though it's just ChatGPT built into Snapchat. So I guess my AI cannot tell a joke anymore, but I do see the story of Steve Jobs here by just simply asking, tell me the story of Steve Jobs. Now, for whatever reason, I found my AI to be actually a little bit quicker than ChatGPT. Um, so it is kind of a cool little, like if you're just happen to be in Snapchat, it's cool to just go into my AI, which is always at the very top, which is a con. The only way to remove that from the top of Snapchat is if you pay for Snapchat plus, but I find it to be more useful. You know, it is kind of annoying, but it is kind of useful if you use Snapchat and you're in here and you just want to search for something really quickly, you can do it right there. But Snapchat is the latest application to integrate AI and ChatGPT into the app, which is an ongoing trend that we've seen for the past couple months now. If you're an iPhone user with a Windows PC, which I used to think was a very uncommon combo, but it's not nearly as uncommon as I thought, but you will now be able to somewhat use iMessage on your PC through the phone link app on Windows 11 and the link to Windows app on your iPhone. So once you have your iPhone and your PC linked together, you will have kind of a dumbed down version of iMessage because you're gonna be able to make and receive phone calls you know, on your iPhone, you're gonna be able to send and receive text messages and view notifications directly from your PC. However, the big catch here is that there is no support for group chats, there's no support for photos, videos, or conversations history beyond the current chat session and the bubbles are going to be gray so you're not going to be able to tell a difference between like the green and the blue bubbles when you use this application so not the best integration but this is just about as good as it's going to get for iMessage on Windows the Google Authenticator application just got updated to version 4.0 and this brings a massive change that I wish I had several years ago when I lost my phone and I lost access to multiple accounts because my two-factor authentication codes that I used, you know, inside of Google Authenticator were on that old phone that got lost. So now with cloud syncing, it says your authenticator codes can now be synced to your Google account and across your devices. So you can always access them even if you lose your phone. So that is a massive new feature. Now there is a catch here. There is a downside because a researcher on Twitter found that these codes are not end-to-end -end encrypted. So if you use this feature, just know that those codes are not encrypted. You'll also notice changes to the application itself along with the actual app icon. So that is the new app icon. This is what it looked like before. I think a big upgrade there as well. WhatsApp and Telegram both got pretty big updates this past week. So WhatsApp just added a pair of new features. The first one being keep in chat, which allows you to keep a disappearing message in the chat as long as the sender does not veto that decision when notified that you want to save a disappearing message that they sent. You can also now use the same WhatsApp account on up to four devices at a time, and each linked phone connects to WhatsApp independently. So all the messages, all the data is still going to remain end-to-end -end encrypted. And then for Telegram, we got a few new features here. So we have shareable chat folders, which will let users easily share chat folders via a link. And then when the recipient taps on the link, it's going to add the folder and they're gonna instantly join all of the chats. You have custom wallpapers where you can now set a different theme for each chat and the person on the other end will also be notified of this custom wallpaper and they can set that same theme on their side if they want to. The bots have been improved and they can now be accessed through any chat via a direct link or by mentioning the bot's username. And there's other performance tweaks and UX tweaks as well, like faster attachment scrolling. Also this past week, we got iOS 16.5 beta three, which I am running right here. Honestly, a very boring update, just like pretty much the other two betas as well. But you can see the only change I found was this up here in the navigation bar where it says all sports now. So before it only showed the three little lines, now it shows all sports up there. And of course this sports tab inside of news is is new in 16.5 in general, but there are other minor code changes, but really nothing else to talk about with 16.5 here. As far as battery life and performance, nothing has changed from betas one through beta three. So nothing to report on there 
either. But we should talk about what is coming next for Apple because it is luckily getting more exciting with time. We are going to have more exciting releases very, very soon. So we're almost in May at this point. So next up, I would expect to see 16.5 beta 4. So I would expect that to be next week, which next week is going to be the beginning of May. I would expect to see that fourth beta right there on May 2nd. Now there is always the possibility of Apple releasing an RC build. However, I don't see that coming until another week. And then we might have the final right there on maybe May 15th. And then after we get that final release of 16.5, we should see the 16.6 betas start up. And then after that, we should see iOS 17 beta one, or we will see iOS 17 beta one right here on Monday, June 5th. So we are just over a month away from seeing iOS 17, which is extremely exciting. And I will have a ton of coverage on that here on the channel. Now, I also wanted to answer the question of why did I start iOS weekly when I have Apple weekly? And the reason is very simple. So iOS weekly is going to be talking about all of the latest iOS and the software based news of the past week. And Apple weekly is going to be about the hardware news, the rumors, you know, things that are not just iOS or software based. So I included them all in one video for a long time now over a year. This is a series I've been doing on the channel for a while, but it started to get kind of confusing and kind of deceptive almost because the thumbnail would show and the title would show like iOS 16.5. And then in the video, you know, for 50% of the video, I'm not talking about iOS 16.5. I'm more so talking about like hardware, like iPhone 15 leaks and things like that. And obviously that just makes it kind of confusing for all parties. So I figured it would make more sense both for me and for you guys as the viewers, you know, if I separated the iOS news from the Apple news and they're just going to be kind of back to back videos. So every Friday I'll have iOS weekly every Saturday I'll have Apple weekly. I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, let me know in a comment and I will try to elaborate a little bit in the comment section. Anyways, let me know what you think about iOS 17 and pretty much everything else down in the comment section below. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you soon.